Professor Franco Pan, thank you very much for joining me now. It's a great pleasure to finally have you. First of all, I wanted to congratulate you that your book, Earth Transformed, an Untold Story, has been translated into Kazakh, and hopefully I'll be, I will read it very soon. But what about your books on Silk Roads? When are, are they going to be translated into Kazakh? Oh, what a, what a great question. I would love it. But um, translating text, it's, you know, it takes a long time and it's expensive to do. Um, but, you know, I think if there's enough demand from Kazakh readers, but it would give me such pleasure. I mean, I love coming to Kazakhstan and to talking to Kazakhs old and young. Uh, it would give me huge pleasure for a translation to come into Kazakh. There's a translation in Russian as well as in, I think, about 45 other languages. But, you know, it's a, it's a business, I think, publishing. So you need to have people who demand it. So I think if, if my editors here are told that uh, people want to read it uh, in Kazakh, it would, be, it would make me so happy. I think there is an interest and I just wanted to know why did you focus your scientific discoveries and studies on Silk Road? It's just interesting that Englishmen from uh, Oxford University exactly chose this topic to delve into. That's a very good question. I don't know what the right answer is because it's a long time ago now that I've been working on these parts of the world. But, you know, I was a child growing up in the 1970s and 1980s. And, you know, it seemed to me that the most important questions were about uh, what the Soviet Union meant for Europe, what was happening in Iran, what was happening in the Middle East, how change in Afghanistan and Pakistan and China were changing the world that I lived in. And Central Asia was a part of the world that didn't get written about very much. I didn't read much about it at school. Um, but the more I started to learn about it, um, even when I was a teenage boy, the more it seemed not only was Silk Roads and the cities and the cultures interesting, but also extremely important. The peoples of Central Asia were historically very important, but also important in the world of today and tomorrow. And I was particularly interested in the interaction between people lived in cities and the nomadic peoples whose stories are never told and never told in a way that is fair. But, uh, you know, I was very lucky that the, that when I was a student, when I was, when I was 20, 21 years old, the Soviet Union collapsed, uh, independence came to all the former Soviet republics, China started to change dramatically, likewise Iran, Afghanistan. And so these parts of the world have become very important again. And, you know, one of the things I write about in my work is that these places were always very important. It's just for the last one or 200 years, uh, you know, their significance was replaced by the rise of the West. But we're, we're living in a different world today. So you mentioned that Central Asia has been relatively under-researched and uh, it didn't catch that much attention from the scholars. Do you think that situation has improved now? I think it is changing. Often in, in Washington or in London or in Beijing, Central Asia is a place that connects global power and it's a place for competition rather than thinking about what matters here in Central Asia. But I've just been giving a talk at the CAPS Unlock conference here in Almaty and uh, talking about some research done by, by colleagues where there are about 13,000 academic papers published about Central Asia in the last 30 years and only 30 roughly uh, mention climate change. You know, it's such an important part of the world today and yet even the, world, even the topic of climate change is more or less not discussed by Central Asian scholars until very recently. But that also has started to change, that the way in which Central Asia has been, a, in, from the point of view of security and geopolitics, we're living in a different time. But things like climate and what that means for the world of tomorrow is a question that needs to be asked here in Kazakhstan. Yes, and this is what your book, Earth Transformed, Untold Story, tells about. But let's shift to the Silk Road topic again. Uh, now we can see that there are two initiatives like BRI and Middle Corridor that countries are involving in. Do you think they have a chance to succeed to restore the ancient Silk Road or at least to get closer to it? Well, sometimes people talk about the Silk Road like it's like a motorway. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not a real thing. It's an abstract term it's a label given to talk about connections in the past and those those what the meaning of the silk road is is something that sometimes scholars will also argue and talk about and i think what 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 is more helpful is what is it that makes people collaborate what is it that makes people want to cooperate to trade who invests in infrastructure and how do you prepare for the long term so planning how to work together is something that's very important as it happens in the golden ages of the Silk Road, when we think about these things, this was a time, of course, where we think above all about trade and 
caravans of camels and silk and valuable goods. But this was also a time of real learning, of scholars sharing ideas. It was a time of people discussing about religion, about faith, and about the meaning of life. It was about ways in which people would move and share and learn new languages and, 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 and learn from each other. So if you take the idea of Silk Rose as being one that encourages pluralism, encourages discovery, and, dis and encourages progress, then I think any initiative that can facilitate and, and um, incentivize is, is a good one. There's a purpose for it. And, and the initiatives are helpful because they give people a story about why they should work. And so I think that those kinds of things are really helpful because otherwise we've become isolated from each other. So I have your book in Russian language of, on Silk Road. And on the first page, it says that Silk Road is the place where West and East meets for the first time. And it is a hub that was serving as a as an center for the philosophical and ideological ideas of 18th century. But if to come to our rea reality, what place and which place of the world do you think now is a leader in terms of these main ideas? I think in today's world, uh, we're like a buffet in a, in a restaurant where you can take the best ideas from everywhere. Opportunities to learn are fantastic. You know, that's what makes me excited about being a professor is that you don't just learn from your next door neighbor or people live in your same street. You can learn from everywhere. And a lot of the problems we have in the world today are ones which are global problems. So the more we study each other and collaborate, then the better. There's a reason why uh, the steppes of Central Asia, of Kazakhstan, were like a conveyor belt bringing ideas from one side of the world to the other ones because nomadic peoples, they moved and they traveled, they had to be constantly mobile. And the opportunities that they could recognize were ones that you know, the ancestors of the Kazakhs were better than anybody else in world history. You know, the ways in which rice was spread, the ways in which metal was and metallurgy was spread three, four thousand years ago, was all to do with people not just moving across using Central Asia from one part to the other, but because people here benefited too. So people in this region are very good at, at understanding and recognizing what the best of, you know, the best examples are. But now we're living in an unstable world where the geopolitical tensions are getting worse and worse from day to day. And how do you envision the future of Silk Road as well as of our Central Asia region that you have been involved for so many years? I think that we as a species, humans are very creative. We're very inventive. Uh, when we're faced with problems, we're quite um, constructive at trying to solve them. And I'm quite excited about what some of those solutions might be. Mm -hmm. So it's true. Today, the world looks like it's a terrifying one of more warfare, more dislocation, disputes um, and problems. But, you know, history is also about survival. You know, we have the highest global population ever, despite the horrors of the Soviet Union and the suffering of the Kazakhs in the Second World War and in, in famine and hunger. You know, people keep on going. And, you know, we should take confidence from the fact that we are creative, we are compassionate, we are willing to help each other, and we are willing to help strangers. And we can learn from some of those examples in the Silk Roads. But to make that happen, you need to have good government, you need to have meritocracy, openness, and you need to have growth that allows people to think that the world tomorrow will be better. If you think the world tomorrow will be worse, then you make negative decisions. So that there's lots that one can do and one can learn. And, you know, I think that the vibrancy of Central Asia, you know, you're much too young to, to, to have been here, you know, when I first traveled to Central Asia 35 years ago, but, you know, the progress and the change has been huge. And there are lots of things that can still be improved from uh, civic activism, from human rights, from openness, from, from uh, you know, from socioeconomic freedoms and, and better opportunities. But the progress has been pretty good. And, you know, if one thinks that things will be better, then I hope that Kazakhstan in 20, 30 years time will be even happier, even though it's a place to visit, filled with scientists, entrepreneurs who are solving problems about water, about crops, about soil. Those worlds can come, and I hope that they will come, because my, my soul feels like it's Kazakh. So, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful for the future of, of your people, that when I keep coming to visit, people are as kind and as generous as they always have been when I've come here before. Thank you very much. You're always welcome in our country. See you here next time.